Good morning. Welcome to NTD. Good morning. Here are our top stories today. An Easter Sunday contro controversy as President Biden declares March 31st the Transgender Day of Visibility. How lawmakers on both sides of the aisle reacted. Cleanup efforts in Baltimore are underway with the largest crane on the East Coast being used to remove wreckage. President Biden says he plans to visit the site this week as Maryland's governor calls for bipartisan support. A Texas judge orders some of the illegal immigrants charged with rioting at the border last month to be released, with another hearing scheduled today. AT&T says the personal data of millions of customers has been leaked onto the dark web. That includes information like social security numbers. The host of Entities Business Matters brings us the details. In California, an increase in fast food wages to $20 an hour is set to take effect today. Some are celebrating, others are not so thrilled. We have their reactions. Easter Sunday is now behind us. We take a look at how people around the world celebrated the holiday. A car enthusiast's dream come true. A classic car show in the UK showcases vintage models from all eras, carefully repaired and brought back to life by owners and collectors. This is NTD Good Morning. Live from our global headquarters, here are Evelyn Lee and Kevin Hogan. Hi, I'm David Lamb, sitting in for Kevin Hogan. Welcome, David, and welcome, everyone. Today is Monday, April 1st. We're heading straight to today's top news. President Joe Biden faced backlash over the weekend for proclaiming March 31st, which corresponds with Easter Sunday this year, as Transgender Day of Visibility. NCD's Daniel Monahan has more on that and the reactions of lawmakers and others. President Biden issued the proclamation on Friday, calling on all Americans to join together in lifting up the lives and voices of transgender people throughout the nation. Biden issued the first ever presidential proclamation for the day in 2021. The Transgender Day of Visibility was started in 2009 and is held annually on March 31st. But in 2024, the March 31st designation overlaps with Easter, one of Christianity's holiest celebrations. The overlapping angered many conservatives. Entrepreneur Vivek Ramaswamy wrote on X, Joe Biden declaring the most holy day for Christians as Transgender Visibility Day is a slap in the face to every American, whatever their faith. Former President Donald Trump's campaign accused Biden of being insensitive to religion, writing, We call on Joe Biden's failing campaign and the White House to issue an apology for the millions of Catholics and Christians across America who believe tomorrow is for one celebration only, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Congresswoman Marjorie Taylor Greene wrote, There is no length Biden and the Democrats won't go to to mock your faith and to thumb his nose at God. Political consultant Roger Stone wrote on X, Donald Trump prayed with the family of a slain NYPD officer while Joe Biden declared Easter as Transgender Visibility Day. House Speaker Mike Johnson called the decision outrageous and abhorrent on X. Democratic Senator Raphael Warnock of Georgia disagrees. He responded to Speaker Johnson on Sunday, writing, Apparently the Speaker finds trans people abhorrent. I think he ought to think about that. A White House spokesperson said the Republicans criticizing Biden are seeking to divide and weaken our country with cruel, hateful, and dishonest rhetoric. Daniel Monahan, NTD News. Independent presidential candidate Robert F. Kennedy Jr. held his first rally since announcing his pick for Vice President Nicole Shanahan. He spoke in Los Angeles on Saturday. Kennedy reiterated his campaign promises of challenging the political status quo. He has long said that neither of the major parties truly have the best interests of the American people at heart. Last week, Kennedy announced Shanahan as his running mate. She's a Silicon Valley attorney and entrepreneur from Oakland, California. Shanahan is the founder of a law firm and the Bia Echo Foundation, an organization seeking to reform abortion laws, the criminal justice system, and environmental protections. 
During his rally, Kennedy criticized President Biden and former President Trump, saying neither of them would work to reform American politics. If you want a change, you need to vote for somebody who's actually capable of changing that. And I don't believe either man is capable of that. I don't think either of them acknowledges the problem. And why is that? It's because they're both the products of a broken system. Presidential candidate Robert F. Kennedy Jr. has been getting some backlash over his pick for vice president, Silicon Valley lawyer and entrepreneur Shanahan. Joining us live to discuss is Mike Leon, Entity News contributor and director of policy and strategy at the Free and Equal Elections Foundation. Leon also hosts the Can We Please Talk News Commentary podcast. Mike, welcome. Now, how will RFK Jr.'s new running mate influence the election, if at all? Hey, David, good morning. First and foremost, good to see you. Um, you know, this is a, a strange pick. Uh, I, I've been very vocal about this because speaking with former strategists on both sides of the aisle, w when you're looking at a vice presidential pick, you really want to get somebody that can either motivate your base or a different group of voters uh, that you are trying to appeal to. And Shanahan doesn't have a lot of experience in American politics. As you mentioned before, she's a lawyer uh, from Silicon Valley. Obviously, uh, she has a lot of money, which will help in this because he has to get ballot access right now to a bunch of different states. He's only on in one ballot right now. But RFK has been polling around anywhere between 9 to 13 percent nationally. So if, if I were him and he was vetting other vice presidential candidates, I would went with somebody else but i kind of get it from this perspective in terms of infusing cash into the campaign but speaking with some independent voters recently across different states and asking them about rfk's candidacy none of them knew who nicole shanahan was so they had to kind of learn a little bit more whereas you know if you look at 2016 when donald trump was trying to bring in a new group of voters evangelical voters he selected mike pence right you know a former chair of the house conference and somebody who is very Christian values. And so that would appease to those group of voters. So I don't think Nicole checks off a couple of boxes that uh, a traditional VP pick would have done for RFK trying to gain a new set of voters into his party. Now, there's a lot of buzz around this VP pick. What kind of backlash has RFK been getting over um, Nicole Shanahan? Well, the, again, the backlash, I think, has been, you know, kind of twofold. It's It's been very, who, who is she, one, but also what has she done around policy, right? You mentioned a couple of things there that she's tried to do. She is she is a lawyer, so she has fought some different cases. And obviously, she's been entangled in a couple of different things because of the money aspect. Google has been at the center of a bunch of different stuff uh, when she was married to the former co-founder. So uh, the, the backlash is, is truly, again, from what I'm hearing from voters versus what I'm hearing from national media is totally different things right voters are more of i, I want to vote for this guy How, is he going to get on the ballot in my state where i can actually uh, vote for him that she's going to help in that regard first and foremost because that's at the the core of it the, the second part is going to be you know what, what can she bring to this campaign if i were to vote for rfk jr if i were to vote for him in november and i'm, I'm the proverbial him not me um if i were to vote for him in november what does this ticket look like? What are some of the policies that she's championing? What are some of the things that she's piggybacking off of his campaign? So that's kind of been the, the outrage, I would use air quotes when I'm saying that, in terms of who is Nicole Shanahan and what does she bring to his campaign? Now, Mike, RFK Jr. said that millions of voters will not vote if they see a rematch between Biden and Trump. And that's where he and Shanahan comes in. What's your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, he's right. Uh, you know, I've said this before, he, uh, not only on this show and other NTD news shows. I mean, 60 percent of Americans in a, in, a, in a sample polling over the last couple of months have said they don't want this rematch. And, you know, if you look at voter turnout in 2016, uh, the 124 million people, then you look at voter turnout in 2020 and it was around 156 million people. The biggest issue for both campaigns right now for, for former President Trump and former President Biden, uh, current President Biden, excuse me, is voter turnout is apathy, is staying home. And RFK will hurt, and don't forget there's Jill Stein and Cornell West that are also gonna be uh, are trying to get ballot access and be on the ticket. And so you could have a twofold here. You could have people staying home and not being part of a large voter turnout for 2020, which I know President Biden doesn't want, neither does uh, uh, former President Trump. And then the second part could be these these third party candidates at the Free and Equal Elections Foundation, we've been putting on a series of debates between some of these candidates. We have one coming up in a couple of months, and we think all of these candidates should at least be on the debate stage 
to debate these issues because, again, the polling shows that 60 percent of Americans don't want the rematch between the two candidates. So more voices, more choices is something that we're championing at the foundation. And we're trying to put on a debate where everybody can see all of the candidates that are available on the ticket come this November. All right. Mike Leon, director of policy and strategy at the Free Equal Elections Foundation and host of the Can We Please Talk news commentary podcast. Thank you so much for your insight. Thank you, David. A House Republican says a Ukraine aid bill could threaten Congressman Mike Johnson's job as House Speaker. And Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky says Ukraine will have to retreat without more U.S. funding. And today's Jeremy Sandberg has the story. House Speaker Mike Johnson is working to assemble allies in the GOP. Congresswoman Marjorie Taylor Greene filed a motion to unseat the Speaker after he worked with Democrats to pass a $1.2 trillion spending bill. Johnson recently spoke with Congressman Matt Gates. In an interview with CNN, Gates said he gave Johnson advice on how to win over House Republicans. Gates was behind the effort to remove former House Speaker Kevin McCarthy last October. He told Johnson that Republicans have to get into a fighting posture. The House GOP wants assurances of stronger border protection from the Biden administration before any more money goes to Ukraine. Johnson called Green's motion a distraction and said he would meet with her this week. He said he believes she is frustrated about the last few spending bills and considers her a friend. Congressman Chip Roy said he thinks Johnson ought to consider what's best for Americans and work from there instead of starting from Ukraine. Green is working to gather allies of her own, but the House Freedom Caucus may be a stumbling block for her. The conservative group supported McCarthy's removal, but does not appear to want the same for Johnson. Chairman Bob Good said no one in the caucus cares what Green says. He called her a one-man show. Other Republicans were open about their support for the Speaker. Representative Don Bacon said Sunday he hopes Johnson prevails while also acknowledging a move to hold a vote on the Ukraine bill could cost him his position. Republicans hold a razor-thin majority in the House. Some in the party say dismissing Johnson now could end up flipping the majority. Congressman Ralph Norman said America is not in a position for another battle to select a new speaker. Jeremy Sandberg, NTD News. In Ukraine, President Zelensky said his forces will have to pull back if they do not get U.S. aid. On Friday, he said a lack of ammunition could force the military to thin out their front lines, creating a risk that Russia could break through and attack Ukrainian cities. Russia recently intensified attacks on energy and other infrastructure. Ukrainian troops have been unable to advance, and Zelensky said Kyiv intended to pursue attacks on targets in Russia, including oil refineries. And back in the U.S., cleanup efforts in Baltimore are underway to remove thousands of tons of steel debris from the collapsed bridge. President Biden says he plans to visit the disaster site this week. Maryland Governor Wes Moore says four heavy cranes will be used in the cleanup, along with over 30 vessels in the coming weeks. One of those cranes is the largest on the East Coast and can lift about 1,000 tons. Governor Moore says the Army Corps of Engineers and their partners will cut up and dismantle north sections of the bridge for removal. He says that will eventually allow a restricted channel to be opened to help get more vessels to the site of the collapse. Moore is urging Congress to approve federal funding needed to rebuild the bridge and to get the port economy back on its feet. This is not just about Maryland. This is about our nation's economy. The port handles more cars and more farm equipment, more than any other port inside this country. And at least 8,000 workers on the docks have jobs that have been directly affected by this collapse. Our economy depends on the Port of Baltimore, and the Port of Baltimore depends on vessel traffic. Maryland's economy and Maryland workers rely on us to move quickly, and it's not just Maryland that is being impacted. On the border, a Texas judge reportedly ordered some of illegal immigrants who were accused of rioting last month at the southern border to be released. The El Paso Times reported the judge ruled in an online teleconference bond hearing yesterday. The judge said the local district attorney's office was not prepared to hold individual detention hearings. The report said court officials stated illegal immigrants will remain in detention if a federal immigration hold blocks their release. It's not clear if the ruling applied to those charged with assault on National Guard troops or just those with charged with rioting. 
Another hearing for other defendants is set for today. Meanwhile, Mexican authorities say they found eight dead migrants from China on the southern coast. Officials said their ship capsized, stranding them at, at sea last week. And coming up, Israel's prime minister says he's approved the IDF's plan for Rafah ahead of hernia surgery yesterday. As protesters in Israel call for a full hostage release and a change of government. And the Turkish opposition secures a major victory over President Erdogan's party in a local elections across the country. It's the biggest defeat for Erdogan in over 20 years. Details after the break. I'm Jonathan Lawson. If you're 50 to 85, I have an important message about security. Write down the number on your screen so you can call when I finish. The lock I want to talk to you about isn't the one on your door. This is a lock for your life insurance, a rate lock that guarantees that once you're insured, your rate can never go up at any time for any reason. But be careful. Many policies you see do not have one, but you can get a lifetime rate lock from Colonial Penn. Call this number to learn more. This plan was designed with a rate lock for people on a fixed income who want life insurance that fits their budget and is simple to get. Coverage options start at $9.95 a month, less than 35 cents a day. Act now and your rate will be locked in for life. It will never increase, guaranteed. This is lifelong coverage that can never be canceled as long as you pay your premiums, guaranteed. And your acceptance is guaranteed with no health questions. You cannot be turned down because of your health. Call for your information kit and read about this rate lock for yourself. You'll also get a free beneficiary planner. Both are free with no obligation. Don't miss out. Call for information, then decide. Read about the 30-day 100% money back guarantee. Don't wait, call this number now. Call now and you'll also get this free beneficiary planner. Use this valuable guide to record important information and your final wishes, and it's yours free just for calling. So don't wait. Call 1-800-357-4821 for your free information. That's 1-800-357-4821. There's no risk or obligation. That number again is 1-800-357-4821. That's 1-800-357-4821. 1-800-357-4821. Call now. What do you do when your tire goes flat and there's no air anywhere? You reach for Bullseye Pro, the smarter, faster, hands-free way to fill it up with air. Bullseye Pro is equipped with a rechargeable lithium-ion power plant. So fast and so convenient. It's like the power of an air compressor in the palm of your hand. Look, you can inflate all four tires on a single charge. It has a built-in smart pressure digital sensor that gauges and automates automatically stops when the set tire pressure is reached. Easily inflate pool toys, exercise balls, and more. Call or go online now and get the complete Bullseye Pro inflation system for the factory direct price of just $79.99. Plus, we'll ship your entire order free and we'll give you a 50% discount on a second one. Order now. To order, call 1-800-984-7221. That's 1-800-984-7221 or go to GetBullseyePro.com. Good to have you back, everyone. Aircraft were seen dropping humanitarian aid into Gaza yesterday. It's not clear which country dropped the supplies. The airdrops are part of an international effort. That's after a three-ship convoy with around 400 tons of food and other supplies left Cyprus on Saturday. The World Central Kitchen Charity says the ships and a barge are carrying enough for over one million meals. Hamas yesterday accused the Palestinian Authority of sending security officers into northern Gaza under the cover of escorting eight trucks. The terrorist group claims to have detained six security force members who crossed through the Rafah crossing from Egypt. A Palestinian Authority official denied the Hamas statements. 
And Israel's Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu underwent surgery for a hernia yesterday that his office said was found during a routine exam. A hospital director said the surgery was successful and that Netanyahu is in good health. Netanyahu's office said he was under anesthesia for the procedure. Israel's deputy prime minister stepped in while he was out. Netanyahu, ahead of surgery, said he plans to be back in action very quickly. NTD's Jeremy Sandberg has the latest in the Israel-Hamas war. Israel's army released video on Sunday of weapons found in Gaza's largest hospital, Al-Shifa. The military said it withdrew forces Monday after a two-week operation. The IDF says troops fought terrorists in and around the medical compound, seized intelligence documents, and found weapons hidden in pillows, hospital beds, ceilings and walls. Israel's Prime Minister Netanyahu, ahead of hernia surgery Sunday, said he had approved the IDF plan for Rafah to destroy the last Hamas battalions there. Over half of Gaza's population is sheltering in the border city with Egypt. Netanyahu said the IDF is ready to evacuate civilians and provide humanitarian aid. Four anonymous U.S. and Israeli officials told Axios the U.S. and Israel are expected to hold a virtual meeting on Monday to discuss the Biden administration's alternative plan. The IDF Sunday said an airstrike in Lebanon killed a Hezbollah commander of an anti-tank missile unit. Israel says it has killed around 25 members of the unit, including at least three commanders. The Bank of Israel on Sunday warned of economic damage if more Orthodox Jewish men don't join the military. Orthodox Jews have been exempt from military service since the founding of Israel. The central bank said the war's economic burden had sharply increased the amount of service days for conscripts and reservists. Protesters in Tel Aviv over the weekend demanded a full hostage release, some calling for Netanyahu's removal. Israeli police Saturday said 16 were arrested for disruption of traffic and road blockages. Thousands in Jerusalem demonstrated Sunday against Netanyahu and against military exemptions granted to Orthodox men. Police broke up a bonfire roadblock in Jerusalem Sunday night. Jeremy Sandberg, NTD News. Police said a suspect in a stabbing attack was neutralized Sunday in the Israeli town of Gan Yavne. Authorities say three people were hospitalized and at least one in serious condition. And also, Prime Minister Netanyahu is facing a deadline today to make a key decision about drafting ultra-Orthodox Jews into the military. So what can we expect? We bring in David Wormser, a Middle East affairs analyst at the Center for Security Policy. Good morning. Good to see you. So today is a deadline for Israel's government, as we heard, to agree on a new law allowing Haredim or ultra-Orthodox Jews to avoid being drafted, basically. What do you think will we see today? Well, I think what we'll see today is that the uh, government is going to appeal emergency to make sure that uh, the government uh, doesn't have to provide a new, uh, a new law. It is working on one. It says it needs a few more days to uh, come up with one, and it will come up with one. Uh, and, and I would expect it to more or less uh, resolve the issue for a few days, but not, not more basically. And I think that's really the danger for this government is that the issue is not resolved more basically. And even if there's a two-day, 10-day, or 30-day extension, that uh, the government may, may face uh, parliamentary motions that could threaten the stability of the government. Right, so the ultra-Orthodox parties have threatened basically to, basically to leave the government, which could lead to re-elections. So how likely do you think this is as a scenario? I actually think it's fairly unlikely at this stage. Uh, I know the ultra-Orthodox parties. Now, to, to, to remind everybody, everybody in Israel has to serve, but the ultra-Orthodox, we're not just talking about religious Jews. We're talking about the ultra-Orthodox, those who dress in black and they have the hats and the, and the sideburns that go down. Uh, it's a fairly narrow group, but it's a fairly large population in Israel. It's maybe 15 to 18 percent. Some do serve voluntarily. Uh, but at any rate, they need to, uh, given that the Israeli military has to expand now radically, uh, it, uh, there's a burden-sharing question, and that's the nature of the uh, court case. I think what will happen is that the rabbis who run the part, the religious parties, will stay in the coalition uh, for the moment. Their calculation is essentially if they leave, there's a government that is a caretaker government for a few months, and that buys them a few months. Therefore, where no issue can be fully resolved, 
On the other hand, if they don't do that and the government has to survive, then they have to come up with a law that answers the Supreme Court uh, uh, query. And that means that you will see movement toward resolution of the of the draft issue. So it's really a question, which route do they prefer? And I think at the end of the day, they will prefer to stay in the government, keep the government afloat, which means that many of them will have to stomach what changes may be made. And, uh, and that and the process will muddle through. Right. So the costs would be too high to actually do make that step. So do you even if, let's say, um, there, this, the, the, the draft exemption would be over, do you expect this to actually make a difference? Because many have already said that they will not actually abide by that. Is that, an, is that even an option? Or could that be that it doesn't make a uh, difference at all? Yeah, many may not, may not agree. And then you have court cases and court cases, and you have funding cuts and so on and so forth. And what gets cut? Uh, the, the Supreme Court already cut the funding to the yeshivas, the schools, but only for the 18 to 25 year old programs or the age group affected, not overall. And, and, and they can probably come up with, with compensatory funding for that from private sources. Uh, anyway, so I expect some of the yeshivas to say, no, we won't agree. Uh, but there's a real societal generational change underway. One is that the Israelis face a major war and they've been shocked into a sobriety about who needs to serve and they need desperately more soldiers. Mm -hmm. uh, but at the same time, if you take the polls, 80% of the youth, the Orthodox youth, the ultra-Orthodox Haredi youth, want to serve and only 20% do not. The, the, the barrier really is the rabbis feel their control slipping from their fingers. Prior, the military didn't want them either because it was a headache dealing with all the restrictions and the special accommodations that would be required. But the military wants these people now, and in critical mass, it lowers the cost right. of bringing them in. That's actually so the so military really is going their way now and talking to directly to many of these yeshiva heads and rabbis and coming up with an agreement. That's why the government wants time is to come up with that agreement. But there will be holdouts, and those holdouts won't cooperate. There will be court cases, and there will be funding cuts. And there may even be, at some point, some, some violence uh, as some re just refuse to uh, resist draft. Right. And I think that's some really good insights that you provided. So thank you so much. I wish we had more time to talk about this. But um, David Wormser, at this point, we're running out of time. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. And Turkish President Recep Erdogan suffered a major setback in a nationwide local election. Yesterday's election was the worst defeat for Erdogan's party in more than two decades. With most of the votes counted, Istanbul mayor and leader of Erdogan's main opposition, Ekrem Emamalu, led by more than 10 percentage points in Turkey's largest city. His party also gained 15 other mayoral seats in cities across the country. In a late-night address, Erdogan called it a turning point. Analysts say he and his party fared worse than opinion polls predicted due to soaring inflation, dissatisfied Islamic voters, and Imamalu's popular appeal. Imamalu told his supporters the victory showed the country that, quote, those who do not understand the nation's message will eventually lose. The nation itself gives the order and the instructions, not just one person. Officials receive instructions from the nation the period of one-man rule is over. As of today, it is done. Addressing crowds gathered at party headquarters, Erdogan said his alliance lost altitude across the nation and will take steps to address the message from voters. In 2019, Imamalu dealt Erdogan a sharp electoral blow when he first won Istanbul, ending 25 years of rule in the city by Erdogan's party, including Erdogan's own run as its mayor in the 1990s. The president struck back in 2023 by securing re-election in a parliamentary majority with his nationalist allies, despite a years-long cost-of-living crisis. Coming up, AT&T says the personal data of millions of customers has been leaked onto the dark web. That includes information like social security numbers. The host of Entities Business Matters joins us to discuss. And some are celebrating California's new $20 an hour minimum wage, while others are concerned. Reactions from both sides after the break.
What if you could whiten your teeth by simply brushing your teeth? Now you can with Smile Actives, the teeth whitening breakthrough that safely gets your teeth white and keeps them white every day just by brushing your teeth. I never thought that whitening my teeth could be so easy. I just put the gel on the brush, the toothpaste on it, brush, and I can see my white teeth. Simply add Smile Actives to any toothpaste and our patented PolyClean technology activates into a powerful microfoam that penetrates into the enamel surface to safely lift and remove stains. You need a simple way to whiten your teeth without strips, without trays, without going to the dentist. And it was about time that a product was developed that you would be able to do that with just brushing. And now, Smile Actives is even better with new Pro Whitening Gel with 33% greater whitening power, clinically shown to whiten teeth faster, up to eight shades. 100% of users saw whiter teeth on food stains, coffee and wine stains, even on veneers, crowns, and dentures. I eat the blueberries, I drink the coffee, and I know that Smile Actives will keep my teeth white every day. If you could use something so easy like Smile Actives to take yellow teeth to white teeth, why wouldn't you? Why spend hundreds of dollars for whitening treatments at the dentist when now you can whiten your teeth with new Smile Actives Pro Whitening Gel every time you brush your teeth? Call or go to smileactives.com and for a limited time, get new Pro Whitening Gel for just $24.95. Order in the next five minutes and buy one, get one absolutely free for just $24.95. That's two for one and save 58%. We'll even include free shipping. Get your teeth whiter guaranteed or return it within 60 days for your money back. I smile every day now. <laughs> The difference is literally night and day. So now I'm always smiling, always choosing, because now my teeth are much whiter. This offer is not available in stores, so call or click now before the special buy one, get one free offer goes away. According to Marx, everything must be seen through the lens of oppressor and oppressed. Our property rights have continued to get weaker. The threat of these takings is no longer just for public use, but also for better use. This means that the government can force the exchange of property from one private citizen to another private citizen. Now, this is nowhere near the Founding Fathers' intentions. We now have a record share of Americans that have never been married, I being one of them. In fact, the median age of a first marriage has never been higher. Now you may be thinking this is only affecting single adults. Well, not exactly. According to Pew Research, one in four parents living with their child are unmarried. And let's take a look at how many children are currently living with either one parent or no parent. Welcome back everyone. We have NTD's Business Matters host, Don Ma, to give us the latest updates from the business world. Don, good morning and thanks for joining us. So what do you have for us today? Yeah, good morning. So a uh, number of things that uh, I wanted to go through today and one of them is AT&T and a data leak that apparently happened to them. Also some updates on Airbnb, uh, IRS, and as well as new US chip curbs on China. So I'll start off with AT&T. So the company has launched an investigation into the source of a data leak. Uh, and by the way, this leak uh, includes personal information of 73 million current and former customers. So it is a lot here, uh, but it seems like it gets worse. Uh, in a news release, Saturday morning, the telecommunications giant said that the data was released onto the dark web. Web. And this contains information like social security numbers as well. So that's uh, very significant here. Mm -hmm. And the company added that currently there's no evidence of unauthorized access to its systems resulting in the leak. So still uh, a mystery as to what happened here. The data seems to have been from 2019 or earlier, and the leak does not appear to contain financial information at least, or specifics about call history. Uh, this is according to at and And the company said the leak shows approximately 7.6 million current account holders and 65.4 million former account holders were affected and the company said it's reaching out to customers and asking them to reset their account passcodes. It's also urging customers to remain alert about changes to their accounts or credit reports, um, adding that at and will be offering credit monitoring at their expense where applicable. Wow, so somebody released it onto the dark web. That's infuriating, but for what it's worth maybe, apparently the data leak did, did not in contain 
financial info, but anyway, people reset your passcodes, I guess. Um, so let's talk about um, the U.S. curbs on China next that you just teased. Sure. So the Biden administration apparently uh, is revising rules aimed at making it harder for China to access U.S. artificial intelligence chips and as well as chip making tools on top of that. So this is part of a bigger effort to impede Beijing's chip making industry. And of course, this is over national security concerns. Now, these rules, uh, they aim to seek halt shipments to China of more advanced AI chips designed by NVIDIA and, of course, others as well. So the U.S. is cracking down on Beijing over the very serious concern that it could help boost China's military. The new rules, uh, they're going to go in, onto effect in thir on Thursday, and they clarify, for example, that restrictions on chip shipments to China uh, also apply to laptops containing those chips. Uh, so the Commerce Department, uh, which oversees export controls, has said it plans to continue updating its restrictions on technology shipments to China. Um, and this is amid uh, its efforts to bolster and fine tune the measures at the same time. Got it. Also very important topic here. So move, let's move on to uh, because tax day is coming on soon. So do you have anything from the IRS for us today? Yeah, just a quick update on the IRS. Uh, so it says that 900,000 people in the U.S. have been submitted tax returns for unclaimed refunds for the 2020 tax year. So that breaks down to over $900 per refund. And California apparently is the state that has the most refunds available with more than 88,000 available. So IRS Commissioner Danny Werfel said that the agency would like to hand over the refunds, but the deadline is May 17th. Taxpayers usually have three years to file and claim their refunds. After that, the money goes to Uncle Sam's wallet. Um, and for those who still need to file, the IRS advises people to get the relevant forms from their employers or go to irs.gov. Yeah, thanks for that, Don. Yeah, tax season is coming up with a close deadline, so uh, we've got to file our taxes. So. Um, what do you know about a new Airbnb policy taking effect and what should travelers know? Sure. So let me start with the changes here. So Airbnb is making some big modifications actually to its cancellation policy. So this is to better cover unforeseen events. The online property rental company says it's going to provide cancellation and refund support for guests when unexpected major events occur, like this is, for example, uh, natural disa disasters and government travel restrictions or weather events impacting a renter's ability to stay at a location. Now, the new Air Airbnb policy overrides a host's own cancellation policy, but it doesn't cover all incidents, uh, which includes injuries, illness, or government obligations mm -hmm. like jury duty. So the updated policy is going into effect for all reservations on June 6th. Well, already it's something, and this little bit of protection definitely puts your mind at ease when you have to travel and book something further in advance. So thank you so much, NTD's Business Matters host, Don Ma. And in case you didn't mention it yet, your show is premiering today. So yep, 4.30 p.m. It's going to be amazing. So everyone watching, please tune in. <laughs> All right, you got it. Looking Thanks. forward to it. All right, thank you. Most fast food workers in California will be paid at least $20 an hour when a new law kicks in today. Entity's Daniel Monahan has more on that and reactions to the change. Fast food worker Ingrid Valorio says gas, electricity, and rent are really expensive in California. The $20 raise is great. I wish this would have come sooner. The law was supported by the trade association that represents fast food franchise owners. But since it passed, many franchise owners have bemoaned the impact the law is having on them, especially amid California's slowing economy. Alex Johnson owns 10 Auntie Anne's Pretzels and Cinnabon restaurants in the San Francisco Bay Area. He said sales have slowed in 2024, prompting him to lay off his office staff and rely on his parents to help him with payroll and human resources. I want to do right by my employees and I want to pay them as much as I can. But this bill, AB 1228, has really hit our operations hard. Um, we're no longer hiring, we're not backfilling positions, we're not growing in the state anymore, we're not expanding more locations, and I'm ultimately thinking about selling or closing my business. Johnson says increasing his employees' wages will cost him around $470,000 each year. 
Over the past decade, California has doubled its minimum wages for most workers to $16 per hour. A big concern over that time was whether the increase would cause some workers to lose their jobs as employers' expenses increased. This UC Berkeley labor economist believes fast food businesses can manage the wage increase. Uh, employers have had it very good. Profits are high in, in the industry. And, um, and so there's also room for them to absorb the wage increases. Through. The law reflected a carefully crafted compromise between the fast food industry and labor unions. They fought over wages, benefits, and legal liabilities for close to two years. The law applies to restaurants that offer limited or no table service and which are part of a national chain that has at least 60 establishments nationwide. Daniel Monahan, NTD News. Coming up, Easter Sunday was marked by celebrations around the world. We take a look at the festivities. In Paris, Easter treats this year featured Olympic themes honoring the upcoming games. One chocolate creation weighed over 16 pounds and cost over $2,700. And a classic car show in the UK seems to have something for everyone. A look at some of the vintage models carefully restored by enthusiasts when we come back. According to Marx, everything must be seen through the lens of oppressor and oppressed. Our property rights have continued to get weaker. The threat of these takings is no longer just for public use, but also for better use. This means that the government can force the exchange of property from one private citizen to another private citizen. This is nowhere near the Founding Fathers' intentions. We now have a record share of Americans that have never been married, I being one of them. In fact, the median age of a first marriage has never been higher. Now, you may be thinking this is only affecting single adults. Well, not exactly. According to Pew Research, one in four parents living with their child are unmarried. And let's take a look at how many children are currently living with either one parent or no parent. There's a whirlwind of emotion and activity going on in this painting. And there's chaos all around and threat from below. The wolves surrounding her and they're anything but unmoved. They're moving all the time, and we sense that. But this little girl remains unmoved. She's in quite a perilous situation, but she's completely strong and serene, and she's actually meditating. It was very, very well liked because no matter what culture or what sort of walk of life you're from. I think people, they see it and they immediately understand what that energy, what that message is, and they, they're they drawn to it because everybody kind of needs a little bit of that in their own life, of, you know, the steadfast calmness and something to hold on to. It's definitely an inner peace in the midst of something very chaotic. And for a lot of people right now, the whole world is very, very chaotic. So I guess that's another reason why so many people are very drawn to this. The 2024 NTD Night International Chinese Vocal Competition is scheduled to take place at Merkin Hall Kaufman Music Center in New York from September 18th to 21st. The competition specially invites vocalists from the world-famous Shen Yun Performing Arts to serve as judges. The prestigious gold award is $10,000. Yeah. Oh. Chinese vocal artists aged 18 to 50 are welcome to register. Good to have you back, everyone. And here in New York City, over the weekend, we had some gorgeous weather. It was a real feeling of renewal to match the Easter festivities. Yeah, there were blue skies and a freshness in the air. Spring is actually here. 
Stephanie Cox was at an Easter parade on Fifth Avenue at the St. Patrick's Cathedral, the home of New York City's Easter Bonnet Parade and Festival, a tradition dating back to the 1870s, where hundreds gathered celebrating Easter while ringing in spring with color and flair. Check it out. Started with a lampshade, and this took 28 hours to make. This is my corsage right down to my sneakers and this is layers and layers how it show my tool layers and layers of tool and tool and more tool and, and we get to see the same people every year believe it or not we actually have a community here of people that love to get dressed i'm an assemblage artist and an interior designer so i'm like a walking installation and I, i'm a master builder but this is a little different than what I normally dress, how I normally dress. If you had a hammer, you mean? <laughs> but but this is, we, we always like to coordinate ourselves for Easter. And so we have. So that was just a short preview. Yes, so for more about the parade, watch NTD News today at 11 a.m. Yes, but of course, Easter weekend is being celebrated around the world. Let's take a look at what they do in Germany. Right, the Sorb community in eastern Germany is one of Europe's oldest and smallest minorities with a language similar to Czech and Polish. They held a traditional horse parade yesterday to commemorate Easter Sunday. Horse riders wore old-fashioned frock coats and top hats. They carried religious banners and sang traditional carols during the procession. The Slavic minority has been living in the area for over 1,000 years. They've retained a distinctive culture and language despite efforts to suppress them under Prussian domination and later Nazi oppression. And you know, I read that in some other small towns they have an egg throwing contest to see who can throw the egg furthest, which sounds pretty interesting too. Yeah, definitely. That sounds super fun too for all the right. kids involved. So speaking of eggs, we're now going to France. Traditional chocolate Easter eggs have transformed into sports themed characters and some Paris chocolate shops. The chocolatiers are creating pieces with a nod to the upcoming 2024 Olympic Games. Chocolates molded as egg-shaped track athletes and timers. Podiums, medals, and other delicious treats adorn stores ahead of the Easter holiday. All in anticipation of the 2024 Paris Olympic Games beginning this summer. I think it's important to be in the spirit of the Paris Olympic Games because normally it will be a huge party. I'm Parisian and I've never experienced Olympic Games in Paris, so it's quite an extraordinary event, and so I think we should support this event as much as we can. This well-known chocolatier is also getting into the Olympic spirit. He's created an Olympic-themed piece weighing over 16 pounds and costing nearly $2,700. The piece resembles a timer stopped at 20.24 seconds to honor this year's Paris Olympics. It features three egg-shaped sack racers around an egg-shaped racetrack, a nod to traditional French sack races. The inspiration for this Easter 2024 collection appeared quite obvious to me since this year is devoted to sports in France. So the process was to connect this year of sports as a nod to Easter through a strong symbol. And of course, that symbol is the egg. The Olympic-themed chocolate creations are well received by customers. I think it's really, really good idea. It's surprising because we were not expecting this. But I think it's a really nice idea. It's innovative and it's different from what we could normally find in the shopping aisles for chocolate eggs. This customer is enthusiastic about the summer festivities and invites everyone else to join in. Uh, I think that uh, seeing uh, this team, sports team, for uh, Parisian people is uh, like uh, magnifique, uh, speaking French. So I think it's a really important time for all Parisian people and for all guests uh, to spend this time here, to, you know, to, to, to get these emotions from, uh, from sport events. The 2024 Paris Olympics will run from July 26th to August 11th. It will be the third time the city has hosted the Olympic Games. Yeah, and about the egg throwing contest, there's like a trick to it because if you throw too hard, <laughs> it'll just break right in your hands. 
Oh, really? Okay, yeah. somebody is speaking out of experience. I was more focused on the chocolate. I was like, mm, yummy. But yeah, that's good for everybody that would like to participate. Here, this guy has some tips. But uh, moving on, for many people, cars are more than just mere possessions. Yeah, classic car owners often enjoy a unique bond with their vehicles, and they love sharing their passion with others. Entity's Jeremy Sandberg has a story. Car enthusiasts are known to have a love affair with vintage cars. This week, the Classic Car and Restoration Show in Birmingham, England, brought vintage car lovers out in droves. One popular entry grabbed the attention of many. To be fair, if you the shy sort, <laughs> you don't want one of these, because the, the appeal is um, you can drive down the road, drive down the, the motorway, everybody's taking your photograph, they're filming you, so you, you've got to drive it really, really careful. Yes, driving this vintage cruiser is legal in the UK, with one restriction. Obviously, you wouldn't use your lights and uh, sirens to get through traffic or get somewhere quickly. It's fair to say classic car restoration is usually a pastime for older gentlemen, but there's some new blood at the show. 15-year-old Arun Bilku is showing off his immaculate Mercedes 190E. He bought the car with his dad. Together, they've spent many hours fixing and restoring their car. He dreams of the day he turns 17 and will be old enough to drive. I'm not like the young generation, which are more into like Playstations and Xbox. I'm more into getting out and joining my car. The holy grail for any classic car restorer is the legendary barn find, a car kept in storage and long forgotten, only to be uncovered many years later. These moss-covered rusty cars might look like junk to the untrained eye, but for a professional, they're original projects that could eventually become gleaming showstoppers. And I think the reason why these halls are so crowded is that people love to fix things. People love to mend stuff. People love to see things brought back from the dead. And Many showgoers were attracted to an average family man's car. This owner says viewers walk away from his Ford Granada happy. Everybody knows what a Jaguar E-Type is, they were very familiar with those. But you see something like this at a car show, to me it means more because you're putting a smile on a face that you could call the average working man. And it's, I feel like I'm doing a service for everybody else then, you see, because everybody's got a smile at the end of the day. Whether it be memories, vibrant colors, or classic engineering, it seems vintage cars have something for almost anyone. Jeremy Sandberg, NTD News. And coming up, what's the secret to becoming a healthier you? A functional health coach walks us through the steps toward reaching our wellness goals and some potential obstacles that could come up right after the break. that truly matters for each and every one of us. This is what you've been waiting for. Shen Hyun, coming to Lincoln Center, April 3rd through the 14th. Buy tickets now at shenyun.com. These are all farmers, maybe no, not this not one, a farm anymore. but here is a farm, right? No, it is also not a farm anymore. All these people shut down because of the government policies? Yeah. The government wants to control the food, so we don't eat meat, but we eat insects. As the price of staples goes through the roof, people will say, I can't afford a steak anymore. So, all right, I'll, just, I'll eat your stupid crickets. Shans <laughs> They would literally be auctioned in front of soldiers and then their soldiers begin to dig. وحشی گریه که تواب تواب عیاره 
زمین که یک جار زور جور لام افراد نکر و تعداد که زور زوریان لگه که همان روزانه دست فروشی دک. Imagine being a a child, you know, having a child mentality, and these evil people come and wheel you away from the only safety you've ever known. Welcome back. Now, living healthier, eating better, and working out more, many people try to incorporate these elements into their daily lives. I spoke to Daniela Deyub Forrest, a personal trainer and functional health coach, about the best ways to reach our wellness goals. She's the author of the book, Own Your Wellness, giving you the tools to break through your health plateaus. Here's our conversation. Functional health coaching um, really allows me to look at the whole person instead of just what exercises are we doing today and what are you eating for breakfast? It allows me to uh, take a look at how you're sleeping, how you're eating, how you're feeling, your family history, your goals, um, your weight history, your stress levels. You're trying to take a very holistic approach or at least take a holistic look at that person. Um, you were talking about their sleeping, their goals even, so why is that important to do? Well, having a clear goal is critical. Like it's, you know, if you just say, I want to get healthy, what does that mean? Or I want to lose a few pounds, right? It's, it's important to have a clear goal so that you can set little, bed, set little benchmarks for yourself and figure out, oh, I've made it X far. But even more important than the goal is why you want to reach the goal. You know, it's one thing to say, hey, I really want to get into my skinny jeans. Okay, why? Why? Just to look good in your skinny jeans? Or is it because knowing that getting rid of your belly fat will mean that you're less likely to have diabetes and you're more likely to be there for your children in a few years? That's a much more powerful goal. People want easy answers to their health problems. So just how common is that issue and why is that one of the main obstacles, you think? Well, I think we're all overwhelmed. You know, there's a lot going on in our lives. You know, I mean, I'm a mother, I'm a businesswoman, I'm an author, I'm a wife. Uh, there's a lot of things up in the air. You know, your parents are getting older, your kids are picking up your time, and people just want a quick answer. They're tired of making decisions all day long. They want you to tell them what to do. But the problem is, then they're not really owning their own wellness. It's not so much about staying in control, it's about that's why I chose the word owning your wellness, mm -hmm. you know, because it's really, it's giving people the agency, the agency to know and to believe in themselves and their choices, the agency to know what's working for them and what's not. I want to believe that many will feel similarly as I do, but realistically, so if I set my goals, I won't always have the self-constraint to really follow up all the time. I tell myself to work no, out more, for example, not. and then I don't. <laughs> and so how... How do you suggest I should go with, you know, sometimes it's that maybe f failure or disappointment. How should people go about dealing with that? I think we have to let go of this all or nothing mentality. I know that even I sort of fall prey to it sometimes. This feeling like, okay, I started this project and then as soon as we hit the speed bump, that's it. We're done. No, you just go over to the speed bump and you keep going. So instead of Instead of using that, that pause in your progress, just enjoy that little break and then keep going instead of starting all over again. Like there's never going to be the perfect day to get your, your goal going. You just got to stay steady. And when you hit a hiccup, you just move in. Thank you so much, Daniela Deyu Forrest. I really appreciate your time this morning. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you. Well, yeah, I think that was 
pretty insightful and I really appreciated she also telling us about you know the agency that people should keep because one thing that really stuck with me was she saying that people if they have giving people the agency means that people will gain more confidence in their own decision uh, in the decision they make about their bodies and I think that's really uh, important for the success right and like in everything in life so yeah I really appreciated that part. Right, yeah, that was a good interview, and confidence does go a long way. I like how she mentioned about, you know, having like a specific or ultimate goal mm -hmm. rather than like a, rather than having just like a, a bar, like, oh, I want to get into my right. skinny jeans. But then the bigger goal is like, oh, I want to be there for my children down the, down the road, you know, be healthy for them. And yeah, those are really powerful goals. Yeah definitely is to drive somebody forward towards that goal. All right, uh, we'll be back uh, in just a minute, so stay with us after this short break. NTD News, the fastest growing independent news source in America, bringing you breaking news from around the world. Expert analysis, investigative reporting, and original award-winning documentaries. We're known for our uncensored China coverage you won't find anywhere else. We cover the stories that affect you and shape our world without the political noise. We report from the heart with you in mind. Watch us right here on NTD News. Good morning, welcome to NTD. Good morning, here are today's top stories. An Easter Sunday controversy as President Biden declares March 31st the Transgender Day of Visibility. How lawmakers on both sides of the aisle reacted. A Republican says the Ukraine aid bill in its current form could possibly threaten Congressman Johnson's job as House Speaker. And Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky says Ukraine will have to retreat without more U.S. funding. A Texas judge orders some of the illegal immigrants charged with rioting at the border last month to be released, with another hearing for more defendants scheduled today. Israel's Prime Minister says he's approved the IDF plan for Rafa ahead of hernia surgery yesterday, as protesters in Israel call for a change of government and full hostage release. Cleanup efforts in Baltimore are underway, with the largest crane on the East Coast being used to remove wreckage. President Biden says he plans to visit the site this week, as Maryland's governor calls for bipartisan support. In California, an increase in fast food wages to $20 an hour is set to take effect today. Some are celebrating, others are not so thrilled. We have their reactions. Niagara Falls has been named the most booked destination in Canada for the April solar eclipse. The town of 100,000 is preparing for a million visitors. This is NTD Good Morning. Live from our global headquarters, here are Evelyn Lee and Kevin Hogan. Hi, I'm David Lamb, sitting in for Kevin Hogan. Good morning also from me. Today is Monday, April 1st. In today's top news, President Joe Biden faced backlash over the weekend for proclaiming March 31st, which corresponds with Easter Sunday this year, as Transgender Day of Visibility. NTD's Daniel Monahan has more on that and the reactions of lawmakers and others. President Biden issued the proclamation on Friday, calling on all Americans to join together in lifting up the lives and voices of transgender people throughout the nation. Biden issued the first ever presidential proclamation for the day in 2021. The Transgender Day of Visibility was started in 2009 and is held annually on March 31st. But in 2024, the March 31st designation overlaps with Easter, one of Christianity's holiest celebrations. The overlapping angered many conservatives. Entrepreneur Vivek Ramaswamy wrote on X, Joe Biden declaring the most holy day for Christians as Transgender Visibility Day is a slap in the face to every American, whatever their faith. Former President Donald Trump's campaign accused Biden of being insensitive to religion, writing, we call on Joe Biden's failing campaign and the White House to issue an apology for the millions of Catholics and Christians across America who believe tomorrow is for one celebration only, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Congresswoman Marjorie Taylor Greene wrote, 
There is no length Biden and the Democrats won't go to to mock your faith and to thumb his nose at God. Political consultant Roger Stone wrote on X, Donald Trump prayed with the family of a slain NYPD officer while Joe Biden declared Easter as Transgender Visibility Day. House Speaker Mike Johnson called the decision outrageous and abhorrent on X. Democratic Senator Raphael Warnock of Georgia disagrees. He responded to Speaker Johnson on Sunday, writing, Apparently the Speaker finds trans people abhorrent. I think he ought to think about that. A White House spokesperson said the Republicans criticizing Biden are seeking to divide and weaken our country with cruel, hateful, and dishonest rhetoric. Daniel Monahan, NTD News. And now for some analysis on both presidential candidates' campaigns. We're bringing in Jeff Cruer. He is a political analyst and a TV radio host. Good morning. Good to have you back. Now, let's talk about Trump first. CNN called Trump's campaign one of the strangest general election campaigns America has ever seen. Now, we have seen Trump selling Bibles, selling shoes, in and out of court, and going public on the stock market. Tell me more about his strategy there. Well, Alan, thanks for having me. Uh, I think President Trump is trying to deal with the unprecedented uh, legal challenges. I mean, never before has a presidential candidate faced all these different legal challenges. He's in court all the time. They're trying to prosecute him uh, from uh, uh, Florida all the way up to New York. So he is obviously dealing with all of that, which makes it uh, not very traditional. He's also, of course, involved in a, a major uh, social media uh, business. It is now going public and is doing well, uh, offering stock to the public, and his uh, net worth is rising. And of course, the Democrats are upset about that. And remember why he had to start his own social media company, because he was banned from his favorite uh, social media outlet, Twitter. So he started his own. So again, it's the abuse of uh, Donald Trump constantly that he has to then react to when he succeeds. They still criticize him. So it would have been nice if he wouldn't have had to start his own, but he did, and now he's made it into a success. And I do think he's doing well in these legal challenges, but it's unprecedented. Never before has a presidential candidate, Evelyn, had to deal with this. Right, so he was somewhat pushed into that more unconventional route. But despite that, will Trump need to increase the number of rallies as the November elections come, uh, election comes closer in order to drive more people to the polls? He's going to, I think, do more as, you know, the trials uh, and, and the court cases, um, you know, work themselves out. I think he'll be able to schedule more. Uh, there's a demand for it. Uh, obviously, whenever he does a rally, Evelyn and uh, Joe, Joe Biden will be in the same state. You compare the two events. Biden has very limited attendance. You know, Trump has a massive attendance. Uh, his support is uh, ferocious. He's got very dedicated followers. You know, Biden does not. So there is a level of intensity difference in the support for Joe Biden and Donald Trump. People are supporting Donald Trump because they love him. A lot of people are supporting Joe Biden only because they dislike Donald Trump, not really because they like uh, Joe Biden. Mm. And talking about Biden, he just wrapped up his campaign tour in North Carolina last week. Do you think he has a chance of winning over the state with because it was a Trump victory in 2020 and 2016? I think this is a, a state that is trending toward Trump, although Biden's trying to see if he can eke out a victory there. Uh, it's a swing state. So it was the only swing state really that went for Trump in 2020. That's why I think he uh, really uh, liked the job that the chairman did and elevated him to uh, RNC chair because that was the one area he had success in the midst of that unconventional 2020 election. But I think it's going to be a stretch for Biden to win there. I don't like uh, Biden's chances in a lot of these swing states right now because he's behind. But Evelyn, we got a long way to go. And of course, there's going to be twists and turns as this election uh, proceeds. And uh, it's going to be, uh, I think, very unpredictable. I think you're going to see an election like no other in that these two are running against each other. But unlike the last time, I don't foresee that there'll be presidential debates and some of the other usual trappings that we see in these campaigns. Mm. Got it. Well, thank you so much for your analysis, as always. Jeff Carrere, I really appreciate it. Thanks, Evelyn.
And a House Republican says a Ukraine aid bill could threaten Congressman Mike Johnson's job as House Speaker. And Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky says Ukraine will have to retreat without more U.S. funding. Entity's Jeremy Sandberg has that story. House Speaker Mike Johnson is working to assemble allies in the GOP. Congresswoman Marjorie Taylor Greene filed a motion to unseat the Speaker after he worked with Democrats to pass a $1.2 trillion spending bill. Johnson recently spoke with Congressman Matt Gates. In an interview with CNN, Gates said he gave Johnson advice on how to win over House Republicans. Gates was behind the effort to remove former House Speaker Kevin McCarthy last October. He told Johnson that Republicans have to get into a fighting posture. The House GOP wants assurances of stronger border protection from the Biden administration before any more money goes to Ukraine. Johnson called Green's motion a distraction and said he would meet with her this week. He said he believes she is frustrated about the last few spending bills and considers her a friend. Congressman Chip Roy said he thinks Johnson ought to consider what's best for Americans and work from there instead of starting from Ukraine. Green is working to gather allies of her own, but the House Freedom Caucus may be a stumbling block for her. The conservative group supported McCarthy's removal, but does not appear to want the same for Johnson. Chairman Bob Good said no one in the caucus cares what Green says. He called her a one-man show. Other Republicans were open about their support for the Speaker. Representative Don Bacon said Sunday he hopes Johnson prevails, while also acknowledging a move to hold a vote on the Ukraine bill could cost him his position. Republicans hold a razor-thin majority in the House. Some in the party say dismissing Johnson now could end up flipping the majority. Congressman Ralph Norman said America is not in a position for another battle to select a new Speaker. Jeremy Sandberg, NTD News. A Texas judge reportedly ordered some of illegal immigrants who were accused of rioting last month at the southern border to be released. The El Paso Times reported the judge ruled in an online teleconference bond hearing yesterday. The judge said the local district attorney's office was not prepared to hold individual detention hearings. The report said court officials stated illegal immigrants will remain in detention if a federal immigration hold blocks the release. It's not clear if the ruling applied to those charged with assault on National Guard troops or just those with charged with rioting. Another hearing for other defendants is set for today. Meanwhile, Mexican authorities say they found eight dead migrants from China on the southern coast. Officials said their ship capsized, stranding them at sea last week. Aircraft were seen dropping humanitarian aid into Gaza yesterday. It's not clear which country dropped the supplies. The airdrops are part of an international effort. That's after a three-ship convoy with around 400 tons of food and other supplies left Cyprus on Saturday. The World Central Kitchen Charity says the ships and a barge are carrying enough for over one million meals. Hamas yesterday accused the Palestinian Authority of sending security officers into northern Gaza under the cover of escorting aid trucks. The terrorist group claims to have detained six security force members who crossed through the Rafah crossing from Egypt. A Palestinian Authority official denied the Hamas statements. Entity's Jeremy Sandberg has the latest in the Israel-Hamas war. Israel's army released video on Sunday of weapons found in Gaza's largest hospital, Al-Shifa. The military said it withdrew forces Monday after a two-week operation. The IDF says troops fought terrorists in and around the medical compound, seized intelligence documents, and found weapons hidden in pillows, hospital beds, ceilings, and walls. Israel's Prime Minister Netanyahu, ahead of hernia surgery Sunday, said he had approved the IDF plan for Rafah to destroy the last Hamas battalions there. Over half of Gaza's population is sheltering in the border city with Egypt. Netanyahu said the IDF is ready to evacuate civilians and provide humanitarian aid. Four anonymous U.S. and Israeli officials told Axios the U.S. and Israel are expected to hold a virtual meeting on Monday to discuss the Biden administration's alternative plan. The IDF Sunday said an airstrike in Lebanon killed a Hezbollah commander of an anti-tank missile unit. Israel says it has killed around 25 members of the unit, including at least three commanders. The Bank of Israel on Sunday warned of economic damage if more Orthodox Jewish men don't join the military. Orthodox Jews have been exempt from military service since the founding of Israel. The central bank said the war's economic burden had sharply increased the amount of service days for conscripts and reservists. Protesters in Tel Aviv over the weekend demanded a full hostage release, some calling for Netanyahu's removal. Israeli police Saturday said 16 were arrested for disruption of traffic and road blockages. Thousands in Jerusalem demonstrated Sunday against Netanyahu and against military exemptions granted to Orthodox men. Police broke up a bonfire roadblock in Jerusalem Sunday night. Jeremy Sandberg, NTD News.
Up next, cleanup efforts in Baltimore are underway with the largest crane on the East Coast being used to remove wreckage. President Biden says he plans to visit the site this week as Maryland's governor calls for bipartisan support. Some are celebrating California's new $20 an hour minimum wage for fast food workers, while others are concerned. Reactions from both sides. Hmong Americans enjoy an annual Easter egg event near St. Paul, Minnesota. Learn more about the church behind the event and its mission. And Niagara Falls has been named the most booked destination in Canada for the April solar eclipse. The town of 100,000 is preparing for a million visitors. What residents are saying after the break. According to Marx, everything must be seen through the lens of oppressor and oppressed. Our property rights have continued to get weaker. The threat of these takings is no longer just for public use, but also for better use. This means that the government can force the exchange of property from one private citizen to another private citizen. Now, this is nowhere near the Founding Fathers' intentions. We now have a record share of Americans that have never been married, I being one of them. In fact, the median age of a first marriage has never been higher. Now, you may be thinking this is only affecting single adults. Well, not exactly. According to Pew Research, one in four parents living with their child are unmarried. And let's take a look at how many children are currently living with either one parent or no parent. There's a whirlwind of emotion and activity going on in this painting. And there's chaos all around and threat from below. The wolves surrounding her and they're anything but unmoved. They're moving all the time and we sense that. But this little girl remains unmoved. She's in quite a perilous situation but she's completely strong and serene, and she's actually meditating. It was very, very well liked because no matter what culture or what sort of walk of life you're from, I think people, they see it and they immediately understand what that energy, what that message is, and they, they're they drawn to it because everybody kind of needs a little bit of that in their own life, of, you know, the steadfast calmness and something to hold on to. It's definitely an inner peace in the midst of something very chaotic and for a lot of people right now the whole world is very very chaotic so I guess that's another reason why so many people are very drawn to this. The 2024 NTD Night International Chinese Vocal Competition is scheduled to take place at Merkin Hall, Kaufman Music Center in New York from September 18th to 21st. The competition specially invites vocalists from the world-famous Shen Yun Performing Arts to serve as judges. The prestigious gold award is $10,000. Chinese vocal artists aged 18 to 50 are welcome to register. Good morning again and good to have you back. Cleanup efforts in Baltimore are underway to remove thousands of tons of steel debris from the collapsed bridge. President Biden says he plans to visit the disaster site this week. Maryland Governor Wes Moore says four heavy cranes will be used in the cleanup, along with over 30 vessels in the coming weeks. One of those cranes is the largest on the East Coast and can lift about 1,000 tons. Governor Moore says the Army Corps of Engineers and their partners will cut up and dismantle north sections of the bridge for removal. He says that will eventually allow a restricted channel to be opened to help get more vessels to the site of the collapse. Moore is urging Congress to approve federal funding needed to rebuild the bridge and to get the port economy back on its feet. Most fast food workers in California will be paid at least $20 an hour when a new law kicks in today. 
NTD's Daniel Monahan has more on that and reactions to the change. Fast food worker Ingrid Valorio says gas, electricity and rent are really expensive in California. The $20 raise is great. I wish this would have come sooner. The law was supported by the trade association that represents fast food franchise owners. But since it passed, many franchise owners have bemoaned the impact the law is having on them, especially amid California's slowing economy. Alex Johnson owns 10 Auntie Anne's Pretzels and Cinnabon restaurants in the San Francisco Bay Area. He said sales have slowed in 2024, prompting him to lay off his office staff and rely on his parents to help him with payroll and human resources. I want to do right by my employees and I want to pay them as much as I can. But this bill, AB 1228, has really hit our operations hard. Um, we're no longer hiring, we're not backfilling positions, we're not growing in the state anymore, we're not expanding more locations, and I'm ultimately thinking about selling or closing my business. Johnson says increasing his employees' wages will cost him around $470,000 each year. Over the past decade, California has doubled its minimum wages for most workers to $16 per hour. A big concern over that time was whether the increase would cause some workers to lose their jobs as employers' expenses increased. This UC Berkeley labor economist believes fast food businesses can manage the wage increase. Uh, employers have had it very good. Profits are high in, in the industry, and, um, and so there's also room for them to absorb the wage increases. Through. The law reflected a carefully crafted compromise between the fast food industry and labor unions. They fought over wages, benefits, and legal liabilities for close to two years. The law applies to restaurants that offer limited or no table service, and which are part of a national chain that has at least 60 establishments nationwide. Daniel Monahan, NTD News. And a church in the Twin Cities area of Minnesota celebrated Easter with its annual community egg hunt. River Life Church's mission is to provide a home to first and second generation Hmong families, along with other immigrant groups. The celebration was near St. Paul, home to the largest urban Hmong population in the U.S. One attendee said the egg hunt was an opportunity for some family fun family time. The purpose of the celebration is to bring the community together, Organizers estimate over a thousand people attended across the church's two locations. And in Belgium, thousands of residents in Antwerp came together yesterday evening to combine celebrations of Muslim Iftar and Christian Easter. They did so by sharing a meal on a table over a mile long, breaking the record for the longest community dinner table in the country. Wow, Iftar is a celebration of the evening meal during the Muslim holy month of Ramadan, which ends next week. During Ramadan, eating or drinking isn't allowed until sundown. Event organizers say the purpose of the event is to bring people together across different religions and cultures. The event was the second one of its kind. Last year, about 2,500 people sat down at a table over half a mile long. This year, the extended table hosted the roughly 7,000 people who registered to participate. On Monday, April 8th, a total solar eclipse will cross North America, passing over Mexico, the U.S., and Canada. The ever-popular tourist destination of Niagara Falls is expecting up to a million visitors to watch the event. The town of around 100,000 expects the event to be a big help to their economy. Here's the story. A rare total solar eclipse will soon be visible across North America. The solar eclipse is the first since 1979 in Canada and 2017 for the U.S. This is encouraging many to splurge on hotels and rentals in advance. The Niagara region, which includes Niagara Falls, Niagara-on-the-Lake, and St. Catharines, has been named as the most booked destination in Canada for the April solar eclipse. We are preparing for up to a million people visiting our city at the same time. Even though we get 14 million people every year, it's over the year. It's not all at one time. To get one million at one time would be by far the biggest crowd that we've ever had. Local business owners look forward to a boost in business during a traditionally slow time of the year. We're expecting to have a full house 
for the first time in a long time, right? We're coming up for the winter season. So it's an exciting time. This physics professor explains part of why so many are drawn to the experience. It's an outdoor experience that you really want to uh, share with your friends and your family, for sure. Uh, you know, I think uh, having that collective feeling of, oh, the sun's gone and, you know, seeing something that's, that's so rare and so beautiful to see the stars come out in the day. If you miss this total solar eclipse, you will have to wait a while to see it again. The next total eclipse in the U.S. won't happen until 2044. And good news to the people living in Texas. Apparently that will be the best place to watch it. Oh yeah, that's right. And NASA recommends to wear specialized glasses, mm -hmm. not sunglasses, to protect your eyes. Yes, stay safe when you stare directly in the sun. All right, we have to wrap up our show now, but be sure to stay tuned for our Entities News Today broadcast at 11 a.m. Eastern Time coming up. And for round-the-clock original news coverage, visit us at entity.com or download our Entity app. Thanks for watching. I'm Evelyn Lee. And I'm David Lamb.